Hello folks, my name is Josh Taylor and I'd like to welcome you to the 12th Annual Telling Tales Festival and our first ever virtual gathering. Whether you are a veteran fan who has been to the festival or whether this is your very first time joining us, we are so happy to see how stories connect us, no matter how far apart we live. Speaking of where we live, the Telling Tales Festival happens in a place where people have lived and told stories for thousands of years. It is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the neutral peoples. Today, it is home to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Six Nations of the Grand River, and to many other indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We recognize our responsibility to learn about their rich history so that we can better understand our roles as caretakers, neighbors, and friends. With a good heart and mind, we honor the sacred indigenous tradition of storytelling by presenting our program today. Miigwech, Nyawe, and thank you. Hi folks. This episode is called Think Outside the Book, Shocking Science and Fab Facts. Speaking of fab facts, you can show off your mad science knowledge and win big by playing the Telling Tales Trivia Contest. Watch this whole episode and spot the dragonfly hints. Then, head to the Telling Tales, Telling Tales Contest page to complete the Think Outside the Book Trivia Quiz for a chance to win a book from one of today's authors. In this episode, we are going to talk about science and technology. Bizarre facts about misguided inventors, inspiring stories of true life achievements, and the astonishing story of where all the stuff we buy ends up. Buckle up, friends, and get ready for Jess Keating, the real-life zoologist who is the brain behind teenage scientist Nikki Tesla, and her colleagues at the Genius Academy. Jess believes that you can do anything. She swims with sharks, loves watching action movies, hosts her very own YouTube channel, and writes books for kids who ask her a lot of questions. Her Elements of Genius series features seven super smart kids who use their incredible brains to ward off evil geniuses bent on global annihilation. Hey everybody, I am Jess Keating and I'm an author, zoologist, and cartoonist. And I'm here today to talk to you about three amazing facts that you can learn in my Elements of Genius series, specifically the real life trivia that inspired some of the events of the books. So the very first book is This Bad Boy, in which you will learn that Nikki Tesla invents something called a death ray. Now, is a death ray real? Do you think that's something that sounds real or do you think that's something that sounds made up? Well, guess what? The character of Nikki Tesla is based on a real life scientist called Nikola Tesla, who was a man many, many years ago, and he was an inventor and an engineer and a futurist, all sorts of amazing things. But Nikola Tesla is actually said to have invented a death ray. Now, it sounds pretty scary, and in fact it is, but nobody has seen any real evidence of this. But at the time, it was thought that he could harness energy from the ionosphere, which is the atmosphere all surrounding the Earth, and then isolate it and put it into a death ray that could apparently decimate an entire nation. I know. Now, before you get too freaked out, don't worry. Like I said, even though there are rumors of it being true, scientists have still not found this thing in real life. So that is the first one. The second little bit of trivia that you will find in this book is that all of the characters go to, go to a place called the Galapagos Islands. Now you may have may not heard of this place, but it is a real life set of islands on the planet and it is absolutely beautiful. But why on earth would I want to send these characters there? So you have probably noticed that in this book, there is a character called Charlotte Darwin. And Darwin, the character of Charlotte, is based on a real life scientist called Charles Darwin. And if that name rings a bell, you probably know why. He is known as the founder or father of evolution. And he was one of the men who discovered that over time, species change and evolve with their, with their growth and history in natural history and through time. 
So he did all of his work on the Galapagos Islands. In real life, in our world, Charles Darwin spent a lot of time in the Galapagos. So I thought it would be a really fun nod to have the characters go there, specifically because Charlotte would love it so much, being named after Charles Darwin. Now, the third special trivia fact comes from the third book in the series, and that is something that, again, you might not realize is actually based on real life science. So in this book, in the third book, Nikki Tesla and the Traders of the Lost Spark, there is a scene where all of the kids, or half the kids, are stuck in a bathroom in the Louvre, and they are using an invisibility cloak. Now, this probably sounds like something pulled out of a fantasy, and a little bit it is, but the truth is, scientists now have actually invented a real-life invisibility cloak. It is called spectral cloaking, and what these amazing, amazing um, machines or apparatuses can do is they can actually direct light around different objects. So if I was wearing an invisibility cloak, a very, very good one it would have to be because I have all sorts of sides and angles, you would be able to not even see me. The light would just bounce all the way around me and it would just probably look like there was just a chair here or just a wall. So you can look that up. If you look up spectral invisibility cloak, you can learn all about it. But the truth is, that is a real life thing that I wanted to pull into this book because I knew it would be absolutely incredible to write about. And what an amazing bit to a story to add, to add a little bit of fun and flair. So that is all the stuff that you'll find in these series. Of course, there is many, many more amazing things you can learn. Everything in these books is pretty much pulled from real life science and then I've kind of added my fun little spin to it. So I hope you enjoy reading, always stay curious, and remember, if you want to get out there and learn as much as you want to, books are a pretty amazing way to do it. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing time. Have a great day. I want an invisibility cloak. Oh, look at that. All right, let's try this one. Let's Yeah, am I invisible yet? Wait, yet? Yeah, now, no? Okay, well, we'll get that sorted out. I've learned scientists have impressive imaginations. Let's explore your scientific imagination and take a break for a completely ridiculous craft you can do in your own kitchen. Here are the things you'll need. Something to make your slime in, something to mix your slime with, glue, we used Elmer's, activator, we also used Elmer's, and any add-ins you may wanna add. The first step to making slime is to pour out your glue. Now the amount of glue dictates the amount of slime you'll have, so the more glue you use, the bigger your slime will be. Now you're going to wanna mix in any of the add-ins you may be using, such as food coloring, shaving cream, plastic beads, glitter, or anything else. Once that's all mixed in, you're going to want to open your activator and start pouring it in, little bits at a time. Once you start to see your slime come together, you can start kneading it with your hands and activating it until you get the desired consistency. Well, budding scientists do have to start somewhere. Send us your pics of your slime by posting them to the uh, Creativity Club on the Telling Tales website. Uh, up next, Kevin Sylvester is going to take us on a little journey to follow our stuff. A Telling Tales fan favorite and famous across Canada, Kevin is the award-winning author of over 30 books for kids. He is a thing for monsters, mutants, facts, and figures, including the fact that he is shorter than most people. In Follow Your Stuff, Kevin shows us why it's important to wonder about what we have, where it came from, and where it's going. Hey everybody, yes, my name is Kevin and I am here uh, as part of the Telling Tales Festival. I love my hat, I love this festival, so I'm very proud to be here. And since we're virtual, I thought rather than go outside, I would give you a bit of a sneak peek at what an artist's studio looks like. It's a mess! 
So for example, you can see that I've got stuff all over the place. I'm working on all sorts of projects. And of course, like any, any artist, it gets a little hot up in my attic studio. So I have all this money available just to kind of wipe off the sweat. All right, I do not have actual money. This is fake money that my friend Michael Halinka and I made for when we do uh, school visits and stuff for our book, Follow Your Money. Now that was a book we actually wrote a few years ago. Uh, you may have read it. It looks like this. <coughs> There it is. Boop. And we have done a follow-up to that, which is Follow Your Stuff, which is the book that I'm here to talk about today. Now, what this book is actually about, the first book, I guess you could say, was about money and where it goes when you like buy stuff, like who gets what. This book, Follow Your Stuff, we wanted you to think about how everything you eat or wear or video games you play where they come from. And we're again talking about the people, the people who make them. So there's kind of a central spread in the book. It's almost right in the middle of the book as well that illustrates a little bit about what I am talking about. So I did a spread like this and you can see all these people. And these are all the people that are behind every product that you make. Yeah, that's how many people go into it. In fact, one of the questions I asked, one of the trivia questions was, how many people make your t-shirt? And it's a trick question. Because of course the answer could be one. You have the person who like stitched it together and then like actually assembled it and then sent it to you at, or to the store where you bought it. But if you think about it, it could be dozens. There's the people who make the fabric. There's the people who make the thread. There's the people who design the logo. But then you have to think about, so it could be dozens, but then you have to think, well, actually it could be thousands. Because of course the dye in this you know, inking or whatever it is, the dye and the stitching, the, the fact that the cotton shirt is, is dyed gray. Someone had to go dig out those minerals and, and grab stuff like that. So we wanted you to think about all of those people. And that was also raises like, I guess what you could call ethical questions. In the book, we have little blue uh, question marks that pop up from time to time. And what they are is they are trying to get you to ask questions about what you buy and, and what happens to the people who help make the stuff. So for example, I mentioned minerals. They're behind all sorts of things like the dyes and our shirts and some of the things in our medication. And the people who have to mine for those are not always uh, in the safest conditions. So for example, one of the things we talk about is sulfur, which is in one place in Indonesia in a volcano called Ijen, I-G-E-N. There are people who go into it, physically go down into this active volcano and they chisel out the sulfur and that's how they get the sulfur that is used in your medicines or in the dyes that are sometimes in your t-shirts. So we want you to think about those people and think about when you pay for a shirt or you pay for something, are those people actually getting compensated enough for the dangerous part of their job? So that's another thing that we wanted you to think about. So those are all the sorts of things that you have in this book. We also wanted you to think about how everything has kind of changed super rapidly. So for example, we also talk about the differences. I'm just grabbing the book again to show you a picture. We also talk a little bit about the differences between say, when you go shopping today and buy things and say when your grandmother went shopping like a hundred years ago. So there's a spread like that. And it's amazing how rapid this change has happened. Almost everything that we buy today comes from all over the globe. So much more of it back then was local. You might have an apple, but the apple is from a tree in your yard. You might have soap, but the soap was actually made from animal fat, from animals that were in your farm or, or in a farm that was owned by somebody that lived near you. So we also want you to think a little bit about how the economy has changed and gone global. Everything has gone global. That's sort of the point of this book. Um, and one of the things that has happened as a result is that people don't even know that they're contributing to something that you might buy. So there's a great story, for example. I don't really talk about it in the book. It's in the appendix, but it's more of an inspiration. There's a great TED talk you should go watch by a guy whose name is Thomas Thwaites. And what he did was he said, well, wait a minute. Why am I buying a toaster? Just a simple toaster. Why am I buying a toaster for like $15? Why don't I just make one from scratch? And what he found out was that what's from scratch means is that you have to go get the metals to make the wires. Then you make the wires. Then you make the plastic. Then you make the elements that heat up so that you get toast to toast, all this stuff. And the amazing thing he found is that if you try to do that on your own, it costs about 
$2,000. So you would buy one for $15, but if you tried to actually make one, it would cost you about $2,000. And so that is a huge part. The people who grab the things that become the things, the finished things that we own, that's a huge part. But one of the things we also talk about is how much the research costs. Everything that's out there, people make it but they also try to figure out how to make it. So like Thomas Thwaites did all that research into how to make a toaster and that cost him $2,000. Think about how much research costs. So for example, pharmaceuticals, drugs and things like that that we buy. When we grab those, the price might be huge and there are lots of reasons for that that we go into in the book. But one of the biggest things, one of the biggest costs in almost anything, especially like the arts or, or medicine and stuff like that, is the research. The amount of time people spend to see if it works, to see if it works well, to see if they can make it work better. So think about that when you read this book. Think about how global our economy is, how many people do little things that lead to the shirt literally on your back, or let's say the telling tales cap literally on your head. There you go, everybody. Stay global and have a great rest of your fall. Wow, we make a lot of stuff now, don't we? I think I'd like to take a trip to the past to see if there are some other low-tech solutions to modern problems, like this bar of soap. Let's head to Westfield and see what they have to say. This is where the Telling Tales Festival usually takes place, but because we can't be here together, I'm bringing Westfield to you. Westfield is an awesome collection of over 35 historical buildings that show us what life was like in Ontario almost 200 years ago. We're about to check out the apothecary. That is what we know today as a drugstore or a pharmacy. There's a lot of bugs out here today. Maybe our friend Will can help us out with some bug spray. Let's go. Hi, Will. Hi, Josh. I think you could, uh help me out with something to take care of these bugs? Hmm, I'll have to think about that. I hate to tell you this, but bug repellent hasn't actually been invented yet. The indigenous people were using things such as sweet grass that they used to create a smoke and animal fat as well. So this is some goose grease in here and they just put the animal fat on and that's how they would uh, help to keep the bugs away. Really, it's after you've been bitten that's really uncomfortable. So people would use things such as mint or some lavender or even onion juice, which would be really smelly, but it did take away the sting. So what we're going to do today is we're going to make an afterbite. We're going to start off with some sweet oil. Now sweet oil, you don't call it that, you call it olive oil. So we'll just take a little bit of this, and pour it out just like that. And we're going to pour it right in here. So that's our sweet oil. Then we're going to take some almond oil and we're going to put a little bit of almond oil in there too. I'm measuring it out. Just going to pour that in. Now we're going to add the essential oils and that's what's going to take that sting away or the itchiness out of the bite. So we're going to start off with lavender oil. It smells really nice. So we're going to put in some lavender oil and then we're going to take lemongrass oil. We're going to put that in as well. And then lastly, we're going to take some mint. And we're going to put in some mint oil as well. There we go. And then we're going to give it a bit of a mix here in our mortar and pestle. You might have a mortar and pestle at home. And that looks pretty good. And just give it a little try right here on a bug bite and rub it in and that's going to help take away that itch. So we have that and I'll package it up and then you can take it home and use it as you need to. Thank you Will. My bug bites feel better already. 
Up next, we have the Stauntons, Ted and Will, here to tell us about real life innovations from great successes to truly epic failures. In It Seemed Like a Good Idea, Canadian Feats, Facts, and Flubs. Author of over 40 children's books, Ted wrote this one with his son Will. Ted's advice to young writers is to pay attention and write stuff down because you can never make up things half as weird as what really goes on. Hi everybody, I'm Will. And I'm Ted. And our book is all about Canadian ingenuity and its best. And worst, we put together a short quiz about some of the endlessly odd and all Canadian items in our book. We'll ask you a multiple choice question. You make your choice, then we'll share the answer. Keep score at home or don't. Okay, question number one is all about inventions. Will? Canadians have invented some fantastic things, including the electric light bulb, the paint roller, peanut butter, Hawaiian pizza, and a lawnmower snowblower conversion kit. An early automobile invented by a Canadian was powered by, here are your options, wind and sails, a giant wind-up spring, a steam engine, 60 hidden hamster wheels. Okay, got an answer? Well, the real answer is a wind-up spring. The spring mobile was invented by a man named Thomas Doherty of Sarnia, Ontario. It was a giant spring that you cranked up and it would propel you about two blocks down a city street at a very, very slow walking pace. Needless to say, it wasn't a huge success. You'd probably say people never quite sprang for the idea. Sorry. Okay, question two. Let's get off the road and into the water. Every year, different places across the country hold boat making competitions. What are these boats made from? Is it concrete, cardboard, and duct tape? I lost it. Keep uh, going. Your cardboard. <laughs> Pumpkins. Yeah. Bathtubs. Or ice. Got your answer? Well, the answer is, in fact, all of them except for ice. The Nanaimo, BC has a bathtub race every year. Windsor, Nova Scotia races pumpkins. Canadian engineering students have a competition to see who can build a concrete canoe. And at the University of New Brunswick, they have a competition about making boats out of cardboard and duct tape. If you guessed ice though, you're not completely off the mark because back in World War II, Canadian scientists tried to make an aircraft carrier out of ice chips and uh, wood chips, in fact, mixed together. They gave up, I think everybody got you know, cold feet. Sorry. Next, let's move on. <laughs> okay, here's a question about the natural world. Why do moose lick dirty cars? Is it because they're nearsighted and mistake dirty small cars for baby moose? Because they wanna show you they love you? Because moose are naturally tidy and just like to keep things clean? Or because dirty cars taste good? And carefully the answer is well dirty cars taste good moose lick cars in springtime because they want to get at the road salt that's accumulated there all the way through the winter they love the taste Yum. all right question four true or false the canadian army once bought ten thousand shovels with holes in the middle got it well the answer of course is false that's because the Canadian Army bought 25,000 shovels with holes in the middle. The McAdams Shield Shovel was an invention that didn't quite work. It was supposed to protect you and at the same time allow you to dig a trench. Unfortunately, the metal wasn't heavy enough to stop a bullet and strangely enough, shovels with holes in the middle weren't so good for digging either. Win some, you lose some, nobody dug them. Sorry. All right, why don't you wrap us up? All right. Finally, one of the great examples of outside the box thinking. Why did the tiny prairie town of Cochin, Saskatchewan, population 148, build a lighthouse overlooking tiny placid jackfish lake? What are our Was options? It? Okay, our options are to guide migrating cranes, to help light wheat fields for easier nighttime harvesting, as a beacon for straying windsurfers, or none of the above. Well, the answer is none of the above. Well, that about wraps up our quiz. Thanks for joining us. And uh, wait a hang on, wait a second. What? Let's let's tell them why they built it. Oh, well, obviously to attract tourists, and it works too, just like down in the Maritimes. 
Of course. Okay, everybody, tally up your scores, add your bonus points, average them out, then divide by zero because it doesn't matter. We'll keep score this way. If you had fun doing it, you're Canadian. We hope you enjoyed the quiz. We hope you'll enjoy our book too. Bye, you everybody. Boat loads more ridiculous facts to impress and annoy your friends. See you next time. Bye for now. Are we just weird here in Canada? Those were definitely some strange ideas. And now for a story about someone whose great idea did work. Elizabeth McLeod is very curious. She learns about heroes, people who have fought for civil rights, explored the unknown, and have been the first to do very difficult things. Her latest story tells us all about Terry Fox, including some facts that hardly anyone knows. Hi, my name is Liz McLeod and I wrote Meet Terry Fox. It's just one of the books in a series I'm working on about great Canadians. Now you probably know a lot about Terry Fox, but when I was working on the book, I found out some things that I think you likely don't know about him. So I'd like to share them with you. Okay, let's start by talking about the things you likely do know about Terry Fox. When Terry was 18, he was diagnosed with cancer and he had to have his right leg amputated from just above the knee. When Terry was in hospital recovering, he met lots of other cancer patients and he was so impressed by how brave they were. That really inspired him and he wanted to do something for them. So he decided he would raise money for cancer research. And the way he decided to do this was to run across Canada. Now don't forget, this is a guy who just lost most of one of his legs to cancer. But he not only was gonna run across Canada, he wanted to run a marathon every single day. So his run became known as the Marathon of Hope. Terry started his Marathon of Hope on April 12th, 1980. That's 40 years ago. He dipped his toe in the Atlantic Ocean just off St. John's, Newfoundland, and he started running west. It was really tough. But Terry kept going until he couldn't. On September 1st, 1980, so that's less than five months later, Terry was just outside Thunder Bay, Ontario, when he announced the cancer had returned and he was gonna to have to stop his run. Terry died less than a year later, but thanks to his Marathon of Hope and thanks to the Terry Fox runs that are held across Canada and all around the world, more than $780 million has been raised for cancer research. If you've ever taken part in one of those runs, thank you very much and give yourself a big pat on the back. Okay, on to the things that you probably don't know about Terry. Now, if you're like most people, when you picture Terry Fox, you picture him with a full head of curls, lots of curly hair. But did you know for most of Terry's life, he had really straight hair. Here's a picture from my book. It's uh, by the illustrator, Mike Dees, and it shows Terry as a little kid and you can see how straight his hair is. Well, after Terry had his leg amputated, he had to have chemotherapy. It's a treatment that many cancer patients have. All of Terry's hair fell out. Terry really hated that. But when it grew back in, it was all curly, no longer straight. Now, another thing that you might not know about Terry is that he was Métis. So Métis are indigenous people who are descended from both First Nations people and Europeans. Terry's uh, grandmother was Métis, but it just wasn't really talked about much when Terry was a kid. About 10 years ago, Terry's brother Daryl decided to look into it and he reclaimed his Métis status. Well, if Daryl is Métis, then Terry was too. And Terry, who is by the Métis Nation British Columbia, was given the Order of the Sash. And this is a really special award and it's given to very special people. Now you might think anything to do with Terry and the Marathon of Hope would be considered really special and treated so carefully. That's not true. So before the run started, Terry wrote away to a lot of different companies asking them for their help, either money donations or other support. So Ford of Canada, the car company, decided that they would donate a van to Terry. So this is the Marathon of Hope van. And you can see here, that's Terry's friend, Doug Allward, who drove the van. This was fantastic for Terry and Doug. Terry could have a snack there. He could have a rest in the van. He could change out of his smelly running socks. And sometimes the guys even stayed in the van overnight. Well, after the, the run ended, Ford took back the van 
they painted it to get rid of all of the marathon of hope signage they cleaned it up remember those smelly uh, running socks and they fixed it all up and they sold it they just sold it to an ordinary family i don't know if they ever knew how special their van was they just used it as a camping van and then they sold it they sold it to a rock band and they used it as a touring van and eventually in 2007 someone looked into this and the rock band sold the van back to the Terry Fox Foundation and the Ford Motor Company again fixed up the van, but this time they put all the signage back on. And today you can see the van in the Canadian Museum of History in Gatineau, Quebec. Thank you so much. I really like talking about Terry Fox and I loved writing about him. I hope you enjoyed learning a bit more about him. Thank you. I thought I knew all about Terry Fox, but wow, that's a person who had a truly great idea. I have a great idea. How about some music? Our friends at the Hamilton Children's Choir are here with a cool exercise for us. Hi everyone, my name's Isla and I'm a singer with the Hamilton Children's Choir. Today, I have a neat exercise of something that you can do with your voice. You may know that the science behind sound, how it's made and how it's heard, is a pretty intense science lesson about sound waves and sound vibrations. A simple fact is that a high sound and a low sound produce different shaped sound waves. Today, I'm gonna to be singing both a high sound and a low sound at the same time. This is a unique vocal technique called overtone singing, and it sounds like this. You can move the higher sound up and down faster and slower as much as you'd like. I hope you have fun practicing this at home and maybe we can sing all together one day with the Hamilton Children's Choir. Oh, oh. I think I'm warmed up now. Up next we have Ishta Mercurio's story about how a girl who dreams of becoming an astronaut inspired her to explore the science behind the shapes we see in nature. Ishta pays close attention to the world around her. She notices interesting things, takes photographs, and writes stories to show us what she sees. Hi, I'm Ishta Mercurio, and I'm here to talk about shapes and curiosity, and how human curiosity about the shapes that we see in the natural world all around us led to incredible discoveries and innovations, like skyscrapers, and even spaceships. The main character in my book, Small World, is a kid just like you, named Nanda. And Nanda is really curious about all the shapes she sees around her in the world. And as her curiosity grows, and she plays with those shapes and explores the different things she can do with them, she makes incredible discoveries. One of the first shapes that Nanda discovers is a circle. Circles are everywhere. Like if you look up at the night sky, you'll see stars. And those stars are shaped like circles. And some of the things you see in the night sky look like stars, but they're actually planets. And those planets are round too. Other circles you can find in nature are the circle that a drop of water or coffee makes when it lands in the liquid. I love coffee. Maybe your parents like coffee too. And maybe you can see the ripples in their coffee when they pour it in the morning. Other circles that you can find are circles in the shape of a flower bud just before it opens. And you can also find circles in the shape or at least the beginning of a circle, in the wide domed shape of the end of an egg. And it was in studying circles 
and domes that humans were able to figure out how to use domes to build stronger and bigger buildings, like the archway in this train station that I visited. And then there are triangles. Nanda discovers triangles when she climbs a tree. If you go out into your community, I bet you can find a tree. And if you look up at how the branches fit together, you'll see that when a smaller branch branches off of the bigger branch, that space in between is the beginning of a triangle. In studying triangles and playing with how we can use triangles in architecture, humans figured out that triangles can make scaffolding extremely strong, strong enough to hold up an entire ceiling, like this convention center ceiling in Baltimore. And then there are spirals. You've seen spirals, I know. My favorite place to find a spiral is in the shell of a snail, like this one, or even the shell of a baby snail, like this one. And we see spirals in things that humans make too, like clockwork things, or this wind-up bug that is powered by a wire that was curved into a spiral. And when the spiral is wound tight, the wire wants to unwind its spiral a little bit, and that's what makes the bug go. And then there are fractals. Fractals exist in snowflakes and in the branching pattern of this plant where the leaves branch off at a certain angle and inside the leaves, the veins branch off from the center of the leaf at the same angle. And then off of those veins, each one of those veins has little branches branching off at the same angle. And these kinds of patterns and symmetry repeat in nature all around. If you only know where to look, you can find them. So why don't you take a walk through your community and explore all the shapes, both natural and man-made, that you can find and see how many you can discover and play with them and see what you can do with all of the incredible shapes in the world around us. Thanks for watching and stay curious about what you see in nature. Thanks, Ishta. I developed a whole new respect for snails. This story is a great example of why it's important to dream big and explore the possibilities of science, technology, and our natural world. Who knows? You might grow up to be an astronaut, to fund scientific research like Terry Fox, or to invent something wacky that might seem or become a good idea. Did you spot the dragonfly? Don't forget to fill out your answers in the trivia contest to win a book from one of today's authors. And of course, keep posting your slime videos to the Creativity Club to gain fame and the admiration of your friends and family. See you next time. Thanks for joining us and remember to visit our website for more events and to upload your artwork, your writing, your videos, and your ideas to the Telling Tales Creativity Club. Telling Tales is all about the joy of discovering how stories connect us. Tell us what you thought of this episode by filling out the survey on the Telling Tales website and you could win a book from one of today's authors. See you again!